Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In our gospel reading today, Jesus urges us to count the cost. To count the cost and realize what it might cost us if we're really going to follow him as his disciples. And if you think about it, doing this, counting the cost, really makes a lot of sense. Counting the cost is something that we do all the time. Jesus gives us two examples in our reading today of people counting the cost. A man building a tower and has to figure out whether he's going to be able to afford to finish it before he starts. And a king going out to war, determining whether he's actually going to be able to win the battle before he sets out with his troops and puts them all in harm's way. But we do this, we count the cost all the time in our own everyday lives, too. Whenever we make a big purchase in life, say like a, a new car or a new house or something, or some other expensive thing, we count the cost. We think about what the monthly payments on that thing are going to be or what kind of interest rate we're going to be able to get on that mortgage and whether or not we're actually going to be able to afford it. And we do this on a much smaller scale, too. Every time we go to the grocery store, for example, we count the cost, especially right now with the way of prices of food and everything like that are. We count the cost as we work our way up and down those aisles, and we decide whether or not those items that we have in our shopping cart are really worth the cost. Are they things that we really actually need? And sometimes, you're like me, you end up taking something back out of there and putting it back on the shelf because the cost is just a little bit too high. And it's not just money either. We count the cost of a lot of other things too. Just the other day, I decided not to read a news article that I found online because at the top of the page, it said that this particular news article would take approximately 12 minutes to read. And I counted the cost and decided that this particular article I was looking at was not worth 12 minutes of my time. We do it with money, we do it with time, we do it with all kinds of other things too. We count the cost. We do it all the time. Strangely enough, however, the one cost that we rarely count is the cost of being Jesus' disciple. We rarely stop and think about what following Jesus might actually cost us. <clears throat> this morning we have the chance to do just that, to think about what it might cost us to follow Jesus and figure out whether or not we are prepared to pay that cost. So let's do that right here, right now. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't leave it up to us to figure out what the cost of following him might be. Instead, he just comes right out and tells us in our gospel reading today exactly what it might cost us to be his disciple. First of all, Jesus says that being his disciple might cost us our family and even our own lives. If anyone comes to me, Jesus says, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, the word that really stands out to us here in what Jesus is saying is that little word, hate. Right? Hate is a harsh word. Hate is a word we don't like to say, we don't like to hear. But what does Jesus mean when he says hate here? Anyone who comes after me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, child, and everybody else, even his own life, cannot be my disciple. When Jesus says hate here, he doesn't mean what we normally mean when we use the word hate. Jesus doesn't mean that we should harbor angry feelings about the members of our own family or resent them or something like that. Jesus is the Lord of love, the opposite of hate. And he would never tell us to do something like that. He would never tell us to hate anybody, let alone the members of our own family. 
Jesus also doesn't mean that we should loathe or despise our own lives either. Jesus, after all, gave us our lives. They're a gift that he has given to us, and he would not have us loathe or hate that gift that he has given. So what's Jesus get now with the word hate here? Well, Jesus is using the word hate in a very biblical kind of way, and it's used in more of a comparative way here. Not hating something as in despising it or loathing it or something like that, but hate in the sense of loving one thing less than another thing. It's a comparative thing. Jesus' point here is that we should love him, Jesus, more than we love our families. And yes, even more than we love ourselves. If anyone comes to me, Jesus says, and doesn't hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You need to love me more than your family and more than yourself, Jesus says. And that's important. Because being one of Jesus' disciples, it might cost us our family. It might cost us our lives. That's part of the cost of following Jesus. That's the first part of the cost of following Jesus, possibly losing your family and your life. The price already seems pretty steep, doesn't it? But Jesus isn't finished. Next, he says that following him might cost you even more. It might cost you your reputation and your life. Whoever does not bear his own cross, Jesus says, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Jesus says here that we have to take up our cross and follow him. Now when we hear things like that from Jesus, I think what we usually think about is that we're going to have to suffer like Jesus suffered, like physically suffering. So when we're sick in the hospital or something like that, or we're in pain, we're taking up our cross and following Jesus. And that's certainly part of it. But I don't think that's all that Jesus means here. When Jesus talks about taking up our cross and following him, there's more going on here than just that. A cross isn't just an instrument that's meant to cause you suffering. It's an instrument way back then that they used that was meant to kill people. It was for execution. So Jesus is saying again, being my disciple might cost you your life. But there's even a little bit more than that too. Another aspect of the cross that we maybe don't normally think about is The public humiliation that went along with it. Crucifixion way back in Jesus' day was reserved for the worst of the worst. For criminals who had been publicly condemned for heinous crimes. In telling us that carrying the cross would be part of following him then, Jesus is also telling us that humiliation that being condemned by the world and the majority of the people in it, that might be part of the cost of following him, of being his disciple. In other words, your reputation, what other people think of you, might go down the toilet because you're a disciple of Jesus. That's two costs that Jesus has mentioned now. Your family and your life, being his disciple might cost you that. And your reputation. Being Jesus' disciple might cost you your good reputation. The cost is obviously really high now, but again, Jesus isn't done. He says that being his disciple, following him, it might also cost you all your stuff. Any one of you who does not renounce all that he has, Jesus says, cannot be my disciple. Compared to those other two costs, your family and your life and your own good reputation. This one maybe doesn't seem so bad. After all, our families and our lives and our reputation, they're worth much more than our stuff, right? But think about that a little more just for a second and be honest with yourself. You really love your stuff, don't you? That's why you have it. Right? That's why you've kept it all these years. That's why the thought of someone like breaking in and stealing all your stuff is so upsetting to you. We love our stuff. 
But Jesus says that being his disciple might cost us our stuff, too. So that's the cost of following Jesus. Three things he's outlined for us here. Losing your family and your life, losing your reputation, and losing all your stuff. That's the cost, Jesus says. In other words, following Jesus might end up costing you everything. The cost of following Jesus is pretty steep. It maybe even seems like it's too much. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, I could have just stayed home and not heard all of this stuff this morning. But there are two things that we need to keep in mind here as we think about counting the cost and following Jesus. The first thing we need to keep in mind is that what Jesus is saying here is that following him will simply require us to keep the first commandment. The very first commandment, the first of the Ten Commandments, says that we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our, and love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the other commandment that goes along with it. That's the second half. That we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Or as Martin Luther puts it in the small catechism, we should fear and love and trust in God above all things. And if you think about it, that's really all that Jesus is saying here when he outlines what the cost of being his disciple is going to be. He's saying that if you want to be his disciple, if you want to follow him, you will need to love him more than your family and your own life, more than your own reputation and life, and more than all of your stuff. That's what Jesus is saying here. The cost of following Jesus is fearing and loving and trusting him above all things, keeping the first commandment. That's the cost. The second thing that we need to remember here, as we think about counting the cost and following Jesus, is that there really is only one person, one person in the history of the entire world who has ever actually paid that cost. And it's not you. It's Jesus. There's only one person in the entire history of the world who has ever paid the cost of discipleship in full, and it's Jesus. Jesus is the one who has renounced all that he had, the glories of heaven itself, to take on human flesh and to be your savior. Jesus is the one who endured the shame of the cross, not only being condemned by the world around him, but being pinned up there on that cross, naked for the world to see, while everyone he knew gathered around at the base of that thing and mocked him up there for everything he had said and done. Jesus is the one who was rejected by his own family. One time, when he was talking about himself being the Messiah, Mary and Jesus' brothers, they came to collect him and take him away because they thought he was nuts. And of course, Jesus is the one who gave up his own life, dying there on that cross. Jesus did all of that. He paid that full price, every penny of it, for you to pay the full price for you, to buy you back from sin, death, and the devil, to pay the entire cost so that you could be his disciple. And because he has done that, because Jesus has done all of that for you, that is what you are. You are a disciple of Jesus, not because you sat down and counted the cost, figured out that you could afford it, and went ahead and paid for it, no. But because Jesus did it all for you, baptized into Jesus and into his death and into his resurrection, you are a disciple of Jesus. And you know what? Throughout the centuries since Jesus died and rose again, disciples of Jesus, just like you, thousands of them, millions of them, have followed in Jesus' footsteps and have paid, at least in part, the cost of being one of his disciples. 
Even today, there are disciples of Jesus in certain places of the world, places like Egypt or Syria or China or Afghanistan, where they are regularly paying that cost for being a disciple of Jesus. But going back in history, there's one example in particular that I think illustrates this perfectly. A young woman named Perpetua, and I think I've told at least some of you her story before, but I want to tell it to you again now. Perpetua, or some would call her Saint Perpetua, was a 20-year-old woman who lived in the North African city of Carthage around the year 200 AD, way back, 1800 years ago. She had recently been married and was the mother of a, a little baby boy, an infant, a tiny little guy. It was illegal to be a Christian in Carthage in those days, but Perpetua had become convinced through interactions with other disciples of Jesus that Jesus was, in fact, the Savior of the world. So she got baptized, she became a Christian, she became a disciple of Jesus. Shortly thereafter, however, he was arrested because her husband found out about her faith. Her father, who was not a Christian, came to her where she was, locked up there in prison, and he pleaded with her to renounce this faith, to give up this Jesus stuff, and to save herself. And she refused. She said to him, she showed him a pot that was sitting over there in the corner. He, she, she said, what is that? And he said, that's a pot. And he says, could you call it anything else? No, it's a pot. And she says, I'm a Christian. And you can't call me anything else either. But he was persistent, her father. And he said, well, do it for the baby. Do it for this little baby boy. Renounce your faith for him. Save your life for him. And you know what? She still refused. She loved her Lord Jesus even more than she loved her own family. She suffered terribly in that prison, locked away night and day, but she considered that to be par for the course. She took up her cross and followed Jesus. And in the end, she ended up giving away everything that she had, even her own baby boy. She entrusted that baby boy to her brother, said, you take care of him. Her brother was a Christian also. And then she was dragged out into the arena there in Carthage and killed because of her faith in Jesus. Now all of that perpetual story, that leads us, I think, to two questions. The first question is why? Why in the world would Perpetua do what she did? Why would she be willing to pay that ridiculous price for being a disciple of Jesus? Well, the answer to that question is really rather simple. Perpetua was willing to pay that price, that tremendous price, for being a disciple of Jesus because she knew that the sufferings of this present age, even the terrible sufferings which she was enduring there in that prison and which she would endure there in that arena, were not worth comparing to the glorious hope which her Lord Jesus has prepared for all of his disciples. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. That's why anybody becomes a disciple of, of Jesus. They don't just do it because they like having a hard time or something like that. We're disciples of Jesus because of the hope of glory that he has set before us, and Perpetua held on to that. That's why she was willing to pay that price. The second question that Perpetua's story raises, and I think this is the more important one maybe for us today, is how? How could she pay that price? I think we can all envision maybe why she would do that, but... We struggle more with how. We struggle with thinking, if I were in her shoes, how would I, or would I even, be able to do what she did? So how was Perpetua able to do what she did? How was she able to pay that price? Again, the answer is pretty simple. Perpetua was able to do what she did because of everything that Jesus had done for her. She was able to pay that price because Jesus had already paid the full price for her. 
She was able to give up everything she had because Jesus had already given up everything that he had for her. She was able to take up the cross and follow Jesus because Jesus had already taken up the cross for her. She was able to give up her life because Jesus had given up his life for her. She was able to do all of this because the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, lived and dwelled in her. Jesus enabled her to do this by his grace. He enabled her to be faithful unto death so that she could receive the crown of life. And here's the thing. Your Lord Jesus will do the very same thing for you. Following Jesus is a costly thing. It's not cheap. It's not easy. And Jesus never said it would be. Anytime we start to think it should be cheap and easy, that's just us deluding ourselves. It may not cost us our lives to be disciples of Jesus, not in North America nowadays. That doesn't really seem to be on the radar right now, but I, like I said, it is in other places in the world. And it doesn't usually cost us our families, although it does happen from time to time that families get split and divided over matters of faith and stop talking to each other altogether. But we could very well, in our context, in our situation, have our good reputations taken from us for being Christians. Christians aren't looked upon very highly in the world these days, I don't know notice. We're considered naive, foolish, ignorant, intolerant, and all kinds of other things because of our faith in Jesus. But whatever the cost is, whatever it is that we end up being asked to pay as we follow Jesus, we know that ultimately the full cost has already been paid. Every single cent of it paid for you by Jesus on the cross. And so whatever we end up having to pay, we know that it's nothing. It's meaningless compared to what he has already given to us, the future glory he has set before us, and we know that we can pay it because of his Holy Spirit that he has given to us who lives and dwells in our hearts. That's the cost of being a disciple. And it's the cost that Jesus paid. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.